Hello, my name is Adam Mudman Bezekny, and today I'm going to be reading a selection from Philip Jose Farmer's The Lord of the Trees. Uh, this scene takes place during Lord Grannis' attempt to penetrate the Nine's headquarters in Africa. The Nine must have marked me off as dead, beyond doubt. I don't know whether or not the pilot of the fighter jet saw me fall into the ocean. If he did, he probably did not fly down for a closer look. He would have assumed that if the explosion of my amphibian did not kill me, the fall surely would. After hurtling 1,200 feet, I should have smashed flat against the surface of the Atlantic, off the coast of the West African nation of Gabon. The waters would be as hard as Sheffield steel when my body struck. If the pilot had known that men had survived falls from airplanes at even greater heights, he might have swooped low over the surface just to make certain that I was not alive. In 1942, a Russian fell 22,000 feet without a parachute into a snow-covered ravine and lived. And other men have fallen 2,000 feet or higher into water or snow and lived. These were freak occurrences, of course. The pilot would have reported that the twin-engine propelled amphibian I was flying to the Parc National du Petit Luango had gone up in a ball of flame at the first pass. The 50 caliber machine guns or rockets or whatever they had used had hit the fuel tanks and burning bits of wreckage had scattered everywhere. Among these bits was my body. I recovered consciousness a few seconds later. Blue was screaming around me. My half-naked body was as cold as if the wind was ripping through my intestines. The explosion had ripped off most of my clothing, or else they had been torn off when I went through the nose of the craft. I was falling over the bright sea, though at first I thought I was falling towards the sky. I whirled over and over, seeing the rapidly dwindling silvery jet speeding inland and the widely dispersed and flaming pieces describing smoking arcs. I also saw the white rim of surf and flashing white beaches and, beyond, the green of the bush jungle. There was no time or desire to think ironic thoughts then, of course, but if there had been, I would have thought how ironic it was that I was going to die only a few miles from my birthplace. If I had thought I was going to die, that is, I was still living, and the eternal end, until the final moment itself, that is what I will always tell myself, I live. I must have fallen about 2,000 feet when I succeeded in spreading out my legs and arms. I have done much skydiving for fun and for survival value. It was this that enabled me to flatten out and gain a stable attitude. I was slowing down my rate of descent somewhat by presenting as wide an area as possible to the air, acting as my own parachute. And then I slipped into the vertical position during the last 50 feet, and I entered the water like a knife, with my hands forming the knife's tip. I struck exactly right. Even so, the impact knocked me out. I, woke, I awoke coughing seawater out of my nose and mouth, but I was on the surface, and if I had any broken bones or torn muscles, I did not feel them. There was no sign of the killer plane or of my craft. The sky had swallowed one and the sea the other. The shore was about a, a mile away. Between it and me were the fins of at least two sharks. There wasn't much use trying to swim around the sharks. They would hear and smell me even if I made a wide detour. So I swam toward them, though not before I had assured myself I had a knife. Most of my clothing had been ripped off, but my belt with its sheathed knife was still attached to me. This was an American knife with a five-inch blade, excellent for throwing. I left it in the sheath until I saw one of the fins swerve and drive towards me. Then I drew it out and placed it between my teeth. The other fin continued to move southward. The shark may just have happened to turn towards me in the beginning, but an increase of speed showed it had detected me. The fin stayed on the surface, however, and turned to my right to circle me. I swam on, casting glances behind me. It was a great white shark, a species noted for attacking men. This one was wary. It circled me three times before deciding to rush me. I turned when it was about 20 feet from me. The surface water just ahead of it boiled, and it turned on its side just before trying to seize my leg. Or perhaps it only intended to make a dry run to get a closer look at what might be a dangerous prey. I pulled my legs up and stabbed at it with both hands holding the hilt of the knife. The skin of the shark is as tough as cured hippo hide and covered with little jags, placoid scales, that can tear the skin off a man as he so much lightly rubs against it. My only experience in fighting sharks was during World War II when my boat was struck in the waters of the East Indian Ocean. The encounter with a freshwater shark in an African lake is fictional, the result of the sometimes over-romantic imagination of my biographer. Unfortunately, my arms were out of the water, 
Fortunately, my arms were out of the water and so unimpeded by the fluid. I heaved myself up to my waist and drove down with the knife and rammed it at least three inches into the corpse-colored eye. Blood spurted and the shark raced away so swiftly that it almost tore the knife from my hands. Its tail did not curve out enough to scrape my belly and my blood was mingling with its blood. I expected the shark to come back. Even if my knife had pierced that tiny brain, it would be far from dead and the odor of blood would drive it mad. It came back as swiftly as a torpedo, and as deadly. I dived this time and was enclosed in a distorted world, the visible radius of which was a few feet. Out of the distortion, something fast as death almost hit me and went by, and I shoved the knife up into its belly. But the tip only penetrated about an inch, and this time the knife was pulled from my grip. I had to dive for it at once. Without it, I was helpless. I caught it just before it sank out of reach of eye and hand, and I swam towards the surface. I looked both ways and saw a shadow speeding towards me. Then another shadow caught up with it, and blood boiled out in the cloud that hid both sharks. I swam away with as little splash as possible, hoping that other sharks would not be drawn in by the blood and thrash of the, bla of the battle. Before I had gone a half mile, I saw three fins slicing the water to my left, but they were intent on following their noses to where the, to where the blood was flowing, where, as the Yanks say, the action was. It was a few minutes to 12 p.m. when my plane blew up. About 16 minutes later, according to my wristwatch, I reached the shore and staggered across the beach to the shade and a hiding place in the bush. The fall, the fight with the shark, and the swimming for a mile at near top speed had taken some energy from me. I walked past thousands of seagulls and pelicans and storks, which moved away from me without too much alarm. These would be the great-great-grandchildren of the birds that I had known when I was young. The almost completely landlocked lagoon on the beach was no longer there. It had been filled in and covered over years ago by the deposit of sand and dirt from the little river nearby, and by the action of the Benguela Current. The original shore, where I had roamed as a boy, was almost two miles inland. The jungle looked unchanged. No humans had settled down here. Gabon is still one of the least populated countries of Africa. Inland were the low hills where a broad tongue of the tall closed canopy equatorial forest had been home for me and the folk and the myriad animals and insects I knew so well. Most of the jungle in what is now the national park of the little Luongo is really bush. The rainforest grows only on the highlands many miles inland except for the freakish outthrust of high hill which distinguishes this coastal area. After resting an hour, I got up and walked inland. I was heading to the place where the log house of my human parents had been, where I was born, where the nine first interfered with my life and started me on that unique road, the highlights of which my biographer has presented in highly romanticized forms. The jungle here looks, what, like, looks like what the civilized person thinks of as jungle when he thinks of it at all. His idea, of course, is based on those very unrealistic and very bad movies made about me. Knife in hand, I walked quietly through bush. Even if it wasn't the true jungle of my inland home, I still felt about ten times as happy and at ease as I do in London, or even in the comparatively unpopulated, plenty of elbow room environs of my Cumberland estate. The trees and bushes here were noisy with much monkey life, too many insects, and an abundance of snakes, water shrews, mongooses, and small wild cats or long-necked servals. I saw a scale-armored ant-eating pangolin scuttling ahead of me and glimpsed a tiny furry creature which might or may not have been the so-called bush baby. The bird life made the trees colorful and the air raucous. The salt air blowing in from the sea and the sight of the familiar plants made me tingle all over. As I neared the site of the buildings my father had built 82 years ago, I saw that the mangrove swamp to the north had spread out. Its edge was only a quarter of a mile to my left. I cast around and within a few minutes found the slight mounds which marked the place where I was born. Once there had been a one-room house of logs, and next to it a log building just as, ha as large, a storehouse. My biographer neglected to mention the storeroom because he ignored details if they did not contribute to the swift development of the story. But since he did state that an enormous amount of supplies was landed with my parents, it must have been obvious to the reader that the one-room house could not have held more than a fraction of the materials. Both buildings had fallen into a heap of dead wood and had been covered up by sand and dirt blown by sea winds and by mud pouring down from the low ridge inland of the buildings. The ridge was no longer there, it had eroded years ago. A bushfire had taken away all the vegetation on it and the rains had cut it down before new vegetation could grow. 
On one side, six feet under the surface, would be four, four graves, but in this water-soaked, insect-infested soil, the decayed bones had been eaten long ago. I had known what to expect. The last time I'd been here, in 1947, the ravages of 59 years had almost completed the destruction, but it was only sentiment that brought me back here. I may be infrahuman in many of my attitudes, but I am still human enough to feel some sentiment towards my birthplace. I had intended to stand there a few minutes and think about my dead parents and the two others buried beside them, but mostly about what I had done inside the cabin with the books and tools I had found in 1898, when I did not know what a book or a tool or a chronological date was, let alone the words for them in English or any other human tongue. And I especially wanted to recreate the day when I had first seen the long, ash-blonde hair of Cleo Jean de Carriol, 